Welcome back to Long Walk Talks Lost. This is your pilot speaking. My name is David Hensley. I'm the owner and creative director of Long Walk Productions, and I am joined tonight by my two co-pilots. Kara Hayes. Robert Bradford. And we are going to be discussing the next three episodes of Lost, season one, episodes 16, 17, and 18. So episode 16 is a Sawyer episode, Outlaws. 17 is a gen episode, dot, 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 in translation. And then 18 is a Hurley episode called Numbers. Uh, so right off the bat, this is how many episodes we should have been keeping track. How many uh, eye-opening episodes have we had <sighs> up to now? It's been a lot. We, should, we really should keep count. I think we're at 11, I want to say. I know we, um, I think there were five episodes that hadn't started that way. That sounds right, because Outlaws opens with uh, Sawyer's eye, except it's young baby Sawyer. Which is also, we've, so we've now seen Sawyer and Jack not just open the eye to start the episode, but also in their younger selves in flashback form. Yes, we baby Jack and Sawyer. Mm. <laughs> um, and then we get an opening scene that gives Sawyer one hell of a Freudian excuse. Uh, that's, a, that's a fucked up thing to happen to a child. Honestly, they... There's a lot of, I mean, we've talked about the melodrama on this show, but I think that one really is just for a, it's very brutal little three or four minute play. Just really sad. Like the moment of, you know, the mention where uh, Sawyer's mom says, you know, your dad thinks you're your grandmother. So he has no idea that his son's in the house while he's doing these terrible things. Uh, just, the you know, the mom thinks she's going to go out and just have to deal with an angry conversation. Like her last words are, what are you doing with the gun? And just that last moment to realize what's going on. And yeah, the, the detail, even from the first time I, I watched it that I remember is uh, Sawyer. We see the suicide of Sawyer's father from the kid's perspective, looking out of the bed and seeing his dad's legs as he sits down. We hear the gunshot and we just see the legs kind of kick to one side just a little bit. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, that's... For working around what I'm sure was a detailed conversation with standards and practices at the network, that's a hell of an example of just letting the audience's imagination carry everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did they have that thing, that kind of thing back in the standards and whatnot? Yeah, that was a pretty big thing. I imagine for a lot of, uh, of their runtime. Although, I mean, some of the stuff they end up doing is they, they get up to some lines. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, network television was and is still pretty tame compared to what you're allowed to get away with in streaming. True, true. Because uh, I feel like it could be an ongoing discussion of what Lost would be allowed to get away with now if it were on a streaming network versus 2004 on ABC. My number one thing, Boone and Shannon would absolutely not have been step siblings. You don't like... The, the streamings would have just had... Hello, like, no. Game of Thrones. Yeah, let's... <laughs> Yeah, that's a good point. I feel like uh, on on a non-network station, if this were on HBO or Amazon or something, there would have been a lot more fucking on that island. Mm. Oh, God, yes. That's been an ongoing joke on Reddit for years, which is you can set aside all the mystical aspects of the island. The um, really incredulous thing about the show is that more people trapped on this island were not hooking up with each other. That's very true. That's very true. I mean, I assume that's what all the, like, extra survivors, the non-speaking, non-credited part, that's what they're doing when, like, Jack and Locke are d debating what to do about boar hunts. They're just off having an orgy around the corner on the beach. Well, let's make that show. <laughs> Lost Yikes. two. Electric um, Boogaloo. If yeah. Nikki and Paulo had been introduced, just, like, putting their clothes back on and been like, well, that was a fun thing to do for two months. What's everybody else been up to? <laughs> uh, well, now is a good time to mention that we're continuing our themed uh, dinner party that sounds weird to say um, watch <laughs> yeah watch party dinner yeah. we're doing themed dinners whenever the three of us get together to watch these batches of episodes and in honor of the episode outlaws we chose barbecue from the dixie pig here in rock hill south carolina it was a damn good dinner too yes it was great barbecue spot i was when uh my wife and i moved down here because y'all have lived down here for a little while gene and i just moved back in uh november last year but being in close proximity to that restaurant was a very strong selling point for the place we eventually settled on. Nice. Agreed. Yeah, I can believe it. Um, so this episode, of course, is all about uh, Sawyer hunting a boar that he thinks may or may not uh, be the reincarnation of a man that he killed. 
Um, we've talked about it in previous episodes, kind of a dichotomy between, um, plots. We open this episode very strongly with the depiction of a murder suicide and a young child having to witness this and go straight into Sawyer thinks a boar is out to get him. How do we feel about that? It is not the last time we'll have the case where the, one of the, one of the characters, zeroes in on something on the island um we have i think a horse uh in the next season we're gonna see oh that's right Um, i forgot about the horse i think sawyer uh also gets tormented by a tree frog at one point like there's there's a fair amount of people just connecting and you know personalizing uh objects and animals on the island there's uh there's also the famous hurley bird which I thought appeared in episode 18, but I guess that's later that it, uh, in season two that the Hurley bird makes its first appearance. I think so. Yeah. Garrett, uh, do you remember the Hurley bird? I don't. The completely random, like pterodactyl that appears on the island. Um, oh, I can't wait for this. Has its own distinctive cry. It's weird. <laughs> I can't uh, wait to remember that. I know. Um, so we get, uh, Maybe not one of the first usages, but uh, the first one that I picked up on of what's going to be a re- reoccurring line throughout the whole show. There's a uh, very great scene where Locke is talking to Sawyer and Kate about, um, you know, reincarnation and it relates to them the story about uh, how it was his little sister, I think, that uh, died young and then a cat showed up. And, it was a dog. Or a dog yeah. showed up and his foster mom was convinced uh, that it was a reincarnated little sister. I would say as a piece of TV writing, I'm not sure how I would feel about that if it was not so beautifully delivered by Terry O'Quinn mm-hmm. in just this offhanded fashion, especially kind of the button where after he summarized this whole thing, Kate asks, like, so you, you think it was your reincarnated sister? And Locke just goes, well, that would be silly. But my mother thought so. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, okay, yeah, that, that brings it home. Yeah. Well, he also says that uh, he felt like uh, that happened. Uh, he specifically uses the word, let her off the hook, hmm. uh, which is something that's going to get, uh, those are words that are going to get uh, bantered around a lot over the next couple of seasons and i love the specific usage of that there's a that and then there's um you can go now mm-hmm. that's another one that's going to get a lot of usage there's also i mean they're definitely setting up where Locke's story is going to go in the next couple of episodes because he specifically talks about his sister dying in a fall she falls off a swing set and that's how just she dies in a tragic accident and you know his, his uh, foster mother wrestling with a guilt and just the fact that he mentions that he was raised in the foster system is one of several hints we get in this about Locke's family background and where he comes from. Mm -hmm. Well, we get, uh, in this episode, we get the reason why Sawyer was in Australia in the first place. Robert Patrick sent him there. Yep. The D 1000 appeared uh, (laughs) and sent him there or, uh, agent Doggett, if you prefer from the last two seasons of the X files. Uh, I'm probably the only person who remembers that. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to lie. When I started watching the X-Files, there was a part of me that was excited to get to him showing up, even though that's generally considered, I think, to be the point where the show takes a huge dip in quality. It really does, but it's still, it's Robert Patrick, yeah. and he's great. So uh, Robert Patrick is an old uh, con buddy of Sawyer's. We get a lot of them going back and forth using... What I've come over the last 20 something years to hate whenever they do like con lingo or heist lingo or something, the Tampa job. Yeah. There's a lot mentioned about the Tampa job. If you're doing any kind of crime related drama, there's going to be the blank job. And it's just been beaten into the ground so much that I never want to hear the blank job ever again. Well, the TV show Leverage, which was basically, you know, a fun series about like an Ocean's Eleven crew pulling off a different heist every week literally titled all their episodes with that structure like the the bank robbery job the foreign election job that like that was just how they named every episode not the not the show for you hensley no honestly i think y'all get a kick out of it it's a (laughs) it's a fun time was there ever uh an episode of that show where they ever had to steal a bunch of hands (laughs) (laughs) it would not surprise me i have not uh, finished the last season yet but i'm sure that joke came around somewhere it had to have um all right. I, I see them both as graduating from uh, the class that uh, Matt Barry taught on that one episode of Community where he's teaching them all to be grifters in that beautiful Matt Barry way of speaking. Yes, I love that man so much. Um, 
So Sawyer is in Australia to kill the man he thinks is the original Sawyer. Turns out not to be. Spoiler alert. Uh, but it's there that he meets Christian Shepherd, and we get our next like overt character connection. And I feel like this is really the first big one. We saw that Sawyer was in the same police station as Boone. Um, we saw naturally that they're all at the airport together, but this is the first time we have two big character interactions and it does not work out well for either of them. It really doesn't. Mm -hmm. I mean, because, uh, Christian gives him a pep talk that inspires him to go off and commit murder. And he commiserates by buying him a bottle of, uh, tequila that he couldn't have otherwise afforded, which is going to contribute to his death from a heart attack very shortly after. Uh huh. Yeah, he mentions having left his wallet behind, and in Jack's last flashback episode, you see when he's going through Christian's hotel room, he finds uh, Christian Shepard's wallet in there. So Sawyer did the nice thing and agreed to just buy a whole bottle. Uh, so uh, as I put in the notes, Sawyer directly contributed to Christian Shepard's death. By the way, we're going to refer to him strictly on a first-name basis from now on, <laughs> Christian Shepard. Uh, got him drunk enough to where he uh, went through heart failure. Christian contributed directly to Frank Duckett's death by giving Sawyer the little push he needed to go and shoot a man. Which just, if, if you're ever in a conversation with a stranger who's just talking in vague terms about not being sure about what, they're, what they want to do, get clarification. Be, be very certain of what you're encouraging the, them to do before you give them just to, you know, get out the door and get it done. Don't be weak. <laughs> exactly. Always good advice, Robert. And that's why I appreciate you. The, uh, something I noticed about this, we were, we're talking back in the last episode where how Kate's bank robbery flashback really felt like they only had enough actual material for like two or three segments, but they had to stretch it across six with procedural nonsense. This one felt a little the opposite because we have, I think, three scene changes within a single flashback. We see Sawyer at the shrimp truck where he confronts the guy but can't bring himself to do it. Then we see him follow him to the bar where he has that long conversation with Christian. And then we jump back to him at the shrimp truck stealing up to do it, which I think is the longest time we've spent in a single uninterrupted uh, recollection to this point. Hmm unrelated to that but if for future episodes we can't decide or if there's no clear theme on what food we want to do i say we circle it back around and we do shrimp definitely keep a, uh, a pen in that i love shrimp um so the next note that i took i feel like is a uh, it's a heavy one and it's one that is going to encapsulate the uh, themes of the rest of the show over the next uh, five and a half seasons who the hell just sits there at a bar doing shots repeatedly like that? I, I mean, I've only ever seen that in like Old West movies and stuff. Right. Like, or when, like, you know, college girls, you know, having like a crazy sorority party. Yeah, that too. I assume. It's one of my least favorite media tropes, which is I, some writers just do not understand how drinking works, I feel. And I don't get that. Like, ugh. maybe if you are just like a complete teetotaler and never touch the stuff and you think that hardcore alcoholics are just out there repeatedly doing how many shots do you think sawyer and christian shepherd do over the course of that scene because they're not pouring right. glasses and sipping on straight tequila they are just each pouring themselves a shot throwing it back pouring a shot throwing it back it's no fucking wonder that christian's heart failed it would have actually been hilarious if Sawyer went back to try to kill Frank Duckett and just emptied his revolver and completely missed every shot because his, well, his I aim mean, is so off at that point. It, he should have. I mean, I'm sorry. Even if they did three shots a piece, like he shouldn't have been able to hold that gun even remotely steady. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's well, also funny. That scene begins with Christian um, joking about how Australians don't think Americans can hold their liquor. Um, well, guess what, Christian? You're not going to hold your liquor for very much longer. Joke's on you. Yeah. <laughs> also, side note, we haven't really done a their dead watch in a while, but Christian does go into a lengthy bit about how, uh, not the island, but Australia. Australia is the hell that everybody comes to, mm -hmm. which may be another reason that the bartender probably didn't care that he drank himself to death liquor. Interesting, because I, I um, and I can't remember which of the episodes it's in, um, but it made me think of that. Um, I think it's, uh, was it Locke? maybe that said um, on the island, everybody gets a new life. Mm -hmm. And that, that kind of made me think, I'm like, oh, 
maybe that's a clue. It's either this episode or the next one because it's when he's talking to Shannon yeah. about why she should just not care about what Boone says about her and Saeed hooking up. Yeah. Um, it, it is interesting, though, because his point is, like, Christian is not literally saying, you know, we're dead and in hell, but he's talking about the places we create for ourselves with our choices and our inability to turn back from the roads we're on, which, you know, as we've talked about, they're dead the whole time is a is not at all what this show is doing. But what Christian's talking about, the idea that, like, you put yourself in a place where you either make a choice to find your way out as hard as that is, or you let your choices carry you all the way down, that's going to be something that the show plays around with a lot over the next couple of seasons. Counterpoint, he could also be talking about the fact that everything in Australia wants to kill you. Yeah. That too. In the words of uh, The Good Place, everything in this country is either a criminal or a spider. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Sorry, Australia, not to dunk on you. They, but, do, uh, the, uh, they do make a quick point about their excellent gun control laws because the guy oh. selling a, a gun to Sawyer is like, you know, makes note that Aus- Australian citizens can't just carry handguns. I often wonder what non-American viewers wa- think when they watch things like this. Like, uh, I know from Reddit that a lot of them just assume we're all walking around constantly packing heat. I think in terms of gun acquisition, I, th- I think they imagine 24 is basically a documentary that just that everybody's like trading gunfire with machine guns on the streets of L.A. at rush hour. Yeah. They're not? Well, not every day because ammunition is expensive. Oh, that's I true. I can only personally afford to do it like two, maybe three days a week. Mm, good point. Um, so I've said before on previous episodes, I don't want this to this show to just turn into uh, lost trivia at, at every intersection because there's a lot of it. Um, there's a shitload of trivia related to the show and into the, to the individual episodes. Mm. But because it comes up in conversation and is actually a critical plot point in this episode, I feel like it's worth mentioning. The connecting tissue between uh, Christian and Jack that Sawyer picks up on is the phrase, that's why the Sox will never win the series. Specifically the Red Sox, I think, right? Yeah, that's why the yeah. Red Sox will never win the series. Because th- this was still on the point where they were in the, the curse of the Bambino. Yeah. Uh, it was only like two months after this episode aired that the Boston Red Sox did win the World Series in 2004. I think, was it even, I think it might have been within a few months of the of the pilot airing because there's a bit in season three where Ben catches Jack up on what's happened in the world in the months since they crashed and he specifically mentions the Red Sox, which gives Matthew Fox a, a great little, oh, what do you know, Yeah, <laughs> reaction. But yeah, like they just... But the, yeah, it was the kind of thing that everybody used in writing for literally decades, and then finally it, it came around. And finally, the Red Sox said, you know what? Fuck you. It's hard to be in that joke. Yeah, exactly. Look what, look what happens now. All right, so uh, I failed to mention, but uh, the Outlaws took place over the course of days 29 through 31 of the show. So they've now been on the island officially for a month. Um, that moves us into... And Claire still hasn't had her baby. No, but she's, she's ready to pop. <laughs> she's I getting mean, there. Good God. Yeah. Well, I'm sure that Claire is as ready to have that baby as we, the viewers, are. For I would her. be too. Jesus, that looks so <laughs> uncomfortable. Yeah. Uh, so that moves us into episode 17, dot, 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 in translation, which, uh, Robert, you mentioned is uh, one of your favorite titles on the show yeah uh, it's going to get a call back later is it two or three when we get dot 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 and found i think that's two if i remember right i think it's maybe when they're on the water i'm not sure gotcha uh this episode takes place over days 32 through 34 and it also opens up with an eye watch this time gin adult gin uh we don't get uh, wee baby gin unfortunately <laughs> um and this episode functionally operates as the other half of Sun's episode. Um, uh, House, uh, how could I forget the title of that <laughs> one? It was House of the Rising Sun. <laughs> um, I know that there are edits out there where fans have done... Somebody, uh, one of us shared the video back and forth about Chronologically Lost. Uh, I think we talked about it, but I, haven't, I don't think I've seen it. Uh, somebody out there over the course of several years took the show and broke it down chronologically. So starting with uh, Abiturno in season six, um, moving all the way up through like the flash sideways stuff (laughs) in season six, put together the entire show chronologically. 
Oh, I have a rabbit hole to visit. I was going to say, how do you even track the flash sideways stuff chronologically? Where do you, where do you place that? Uh, I would love to find out. The thing is that it's not like streaming anywhere. Obviously it's not even on YouTube. You have to go to a specific website and download huge chunks of files because this is stuff that takes place over the course of 121 episodes. Mm. So uh, if you consider that's 121 hours worth of material, wow. um, that's, those are going to be pretty big files. But I say that to say I would love to see where somebody put together House of the Rising Sun and in translation together to see how well these fit. Because I already know that there's a continuity error regarding that dog. Yeah. <laughs> the dog is a puppy when Jin steals it from that poor, poor child. <laughs> it brings it home and gives it to Sun. Well, he doesn't steal it. Her dad gives it to him in, Forces in gratitude. Him to That's take it. Good point, yeah. Uh, what is supposed to be the next day when he has to uh, go and beat up that uh, Korean official, the dog is fully grown now. Yeah. The world's fastest growing dog. Um, let's see what else. Uh, so more connective tissue. Uh, the first time that Jin goes to visit, uh, this Korean official, he had some fancy title like energy. Uh, It's like secretary for energy development, which is apparently not a real position in the Korean government. Like they just made up a official sounding title. Uh, if I were them, I probably would have done that as well. Mm -hmm. Um, but the first time he goes and, uh, visits this guy in the background while his daughter is watching TV, you see Hurley's interview, which we will get the full context for in the next episode, which I think is fun as hell because now we're really starting to see how much thought they have put into, uh, these background events. It is interesting that in, um, Especially in Sawyer's episode, we don't have a lot in the way of, like, on-island mythology. It really is just a little character journey. But they give us, like, a big, like you said, the biggest connection we've had of him and Christian Shepard actually crossing paths. And that paying off when he realizes who that Jack was the son of the guy he was talking to. And then, yeah, they really do, like you said. Uh, there's one that I didn't even realize. Sawyer, when uh, Robert Patrick comes into his hotel room, uh, he's implied to be, like, working his con on this woman that he's hooking up with. That woman is reading the numbers in Hurley's episode. Same actress. Oh. Yeah. I did literally did not know that until I was looking up just stuff about these episodes. It's Brittany Perrineau, by the way, who is the wife of Harold Perrineau, who plays Michael. She plays both Sawyer's, uh, I guess, would-be Mark and the lady who reads off the winning numbers for Hurley. So is she supposed to be the same character or did they ever just like, hey, Brittany Perrineau, you're on set? I would love to think that Sawyer is working some kind of con that involves rigging a lottery outcome that he's he's trying to get her to actually like pull something where it's like, I need to know what these are in advance. Or, mm-hmm. or he's, he's trying to pull a con on a poor TV news reporter whose husband is loaded or something like that. <laughs> something like that. Wow, that's a deep pull. Um, wow. OK, did not know that one. Um, now we move into something we're going to have to be very careful about. I feel maybe I should have put this on here. Sawyer's offensive nickname watch. Yeah. Uh, he refers to Jin as Bruce, which as far as offensive nicknames go, that one's not too terrible, I suppose, especially considering some of the stuff he says to Saeed. Yeah. Um, but he also calls Jin Betty and I do not under, I didn't get this one. So I didn't either, but when I was looking into it, And I, so basically it's a callback, a way callback to when, uh, Betty White used to be on a show called, um, uh, pick the liar or something like that. I forget what the show is called, but basically she would come up with the most outrageous and outlandish explanations for like, say how something works or, you know, and, and so it was sort of that you're telling this really crazy story so okay betty i don't know that any i wouldn't have gotten that in the year 2000 whatever so it was so out there so that one is less of an offensive nickname and more of a deep pull on sawyer's part very deep yes i i feel like people that were probably in the age range of about 40 to 50 might have gotten that reference. Would have loved it if they all stopped what they were doing and like, hold on, 
we, we got to figure this out. What, what do you, none of us get what you're talking about, Sawyer. Can you, can you break that down a little bit? Well, don't you guys remember there used to be this show? You know what? We're, we're fighting about something. <laughs> no, I would love that as well. Um, I love this episode because I love seeing um, sweet, innocent Jen before we saw uh, sexist and uh, emotionally abusive Jen um, when he was so naive. Uh, this episode is all about how he started working for Mr. Pake, uh, son's father, and went down a rabbit hole uh, in the Korean criminal underworld and how the poor sweet man didn't understand what have a talk with somebody means. And all credit to Daniel Day Kim, who gets the job of like, okay, make uh, bridge the character we want you to be going forward, and especially in these flashbacks with the guy we met in the first episode who is just glaring at everybody and like looking like he's gonna blow a gasket when his wife undoes the top button of her shirt Mm -hmm. and he pulls that off because man that dude is a really good actor yeah uh i gotta say though i've never been so grateful to somebody for not beating me up that i gave them my dog there's a weird theme in this show and i didn't again there's nothing's coming back to me Parents get beaten up in front of their kids a lot, or parents beat other people up in front of their kids a lot. Because uh, Jin uh, beats the crap out of Michael, and then uh, Walt has to watch him get beaten down by Saeed. Um, we've got in this episode, Jin does deliver the beating of the secretary. I'm sure there's a scene where Ben gets the crap beaten out of him in front of Alex. There's a bit where um, when he's trying to ki- he comes to kill Penny, and Desmond beats the hell out of him in front of little baby Charlie. I'm I'm not even sure what that means or what it is, but it's just a thing that the writers keep doing. I'm I, sure that if we if we uh, dove deep enough in there, we could come out with something about toxic masculinity because it's exclusively the dudes beating up people in front of their kids. I don't think we ever have any scenes of women beating each other up in front of children. I would love to see Claire like break her cradle over somebody's head while Aaron's just curled up on a rock nearby. Yeah, but I mean, you know, we did have that episode, you know, like Daddy Cowboys or whatever. Mm, Cowboy Daddies, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So somebody has daddy issues. All of them. All of them have daddy issues. Except, well, his issues are different. Jin, who has like all of the the love and goodness that nobody else's dads have, got like confined into this one man. Yeah, and and it still uh, fucked him up, as we'll get to very shortly. I I brought all that up... uh, because we've already sort of touched on it, but that poor little girl, (laughs) uh, as Katie, my wife pointed out when she was watching with us, um, she has to, in the course of 24 hours, she gets her puppy taken away from her and given to a stranger. And then she gets to watch that stranger beat the shit out of her dad, much like Sawyer's episode, but to a much less degree, that'll fuck you up as a kid. There's also a dude in a white suit in the doorway with a silenced gun in his hand. Yes. Mm -hmm. Wearing latex gloves. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we should get more of that girl like in her 20s smoking a cigarette in a bar and she just randomly thinks about that time her dad took her puppy away and she's like, <laughs> could that have been it? Could that have been my start of darkness? No. It, it is really weird that nobody's ever, as far as I'm more seriously talked about doing like a, a later sequel or reboot or reimagining of Lost since then, just in our constant society of remakes and reimagining not saying it'd be a good idea, but I'm surprised nobody's made any kind of serious push for it. I'm glad they haven't. I have uh, a whole ass idea about how I would do it, um, which we won't talk about on here. Yeah. I would um, trust you, though. Thank you. You're I probably the that. only person I would trust to do it. Yeah, listeners, here's something that you need to know about how my broken brain works. Um, this was this was more prevalent when I was uh, a smoker because like, my wife would go to bed at 30, 9 o'clock at night, and I am a night owl, so I would sit outside... And chain smoke cigarettes, and I would just come up with random fucking ideas. Um, and one of them at one point was like, "How would a sequel series to Lost work?" And I started thinking about that and chasing that uh, high. And yeah, I came up with a whole thing. Anyway, uh, it's going to involve this little girl. Mm. Spoiler alert: uh, she's going to be the main character, and we're going to get to find out more about her and what happened after her puppy was taken away. Nice. I just made all that up. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so in a uh, in a later scene, um, 
as people are so poor Jen has been basically hunted down by Sawyer and dragged back to the beach after and, the raft burns that Michael's been working on yes yes um, yeah that's a like critical point about this episode is somebody set fire to the raft and everyone thinks it was Jen because he's got the burns on his hands and uh, son doesn't believe him when he says he didn't do it so Sawyer hunts him down surprisingly proficient at tracking despite not being able to do it well in the last episode um, drags him back, and we finally, for the first time, see, or rather hear, what all of these idiots shouting at each other sounds like from Jen's point of view. Um, which is not something I remembered, but is a really nice touch. Yeah, just a reminder that all he hears is gibberish and people, like, shouting and pointing. Did Do you know how they did that? Hmm. Again, something else I, I randomly found. Um, that is the exact same conversation that they were having played backwards. That makes sense. I thought backmasking would have something to do with that. Yep. Another interesting thing about uh, when Sawyer's dragging him back is he makes the first explicit reference on the show to Lord of the Flies, which is, you know, one of the touch points of, you know, island castaway uh, literature. Um, and despite, you know, a prominent character named Jack, a uh, heavyset figure who serves as the show's sort of moral center, and Boars being a really big deal, this is the first time anybody's actually title dropped that particular work. Again, another connection mm -hmm. to the dark tower and all that stuff. How, is, how so? Isn't it, um, doesn't that come up in the talisman? Which one of the books talked about Lord of the Flies? Oh, shit. I didn't even think about that. Yeah, no. Yeah, um, yeah it's one of the, the dark tower adjacent books that uh, people spend a lot of time talking about Lord of the Flies. Fuck. Well, we, we read all of those books, Kara and I did, so, like, in such close proximity to each other that they all they sort all of blend together. together. Yeah. Um, but I, I picked up on that. I was like, mm, that's another link. Yes. Well, non-link, but. Um, it's during this episode that we get confirmation that Yoon Jung Kim is still the best actor on the fucking show by a mile. In an episode that's supposed to be about Daniel Day Kim. Um, is that? That's right. Yes. Daniel Day Kim. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, I doubted myself for a second. There's so many people on the show. Um, that's all about his character. She really steals the show here. That last scene at the cave where she yells at him. Um, she's trying to get him to talk to her after he finds out she speaks English and she breaks and starts shouting in English. I was going to leave you. I was going to walk away and then switches back to Korean to ask him if there's any chance they can just start over again. And he just, says no and walks off like I, I teared up watching that because she's just so committed to that and um like that that really is what makes this show work is just the, when the actors just dig in and just commit so sincerely to it like all the soapiness and drama just it, it tears your heart out and it's a really nice usage of uh the way that plot structure can be used um because i, I particularly like the usage in the here of the hourglass plot uh, because we find out that um, before they left to go to Australia, um, or no, um, yeah, before they left to go to Australia, um, Sun was planning on leaving Jen, and Jen was going to try to rekindle the romance by staying in L.A. with her and getting out from under her father. Uh, and now we've come full circle here because it's Sun who wants to try to rekindle the romance with him, and he's the one that ends up walking away from her. Yeah. Which is just fucking tragic. Yeah. Um, but as, uh, as Robert alluded to, we get our rare instance of a good dad watch. Oh, yes. Yeah. Mr. Kwan is the best dad on the show. I know it's probably too early and I might uh, be proven wrong about that, but I, I think that... I don't think there are going to be any better dads than poor beleaguered Mr. Kwan. I don't think so either. That was just the absolute yeah. sweetest human being I, I think I've seen in a very long time on a show. Like just he just Jen, was precious. After presumably having little to no contact with him for years and telling everybody that his father is dead because he doesn't want to admit that he just comes from a, a nobody fishing village, Jen comes to him for advice and he just hugs him and immediately just wants to hear about everything that's happening. Just yeah. like, yeah, like no, no, where have you been? Why haven't you, you know, come home? No guilt trip. It's just, 
Oh, you're home. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. This was the first legitimate jaw drop from Katie. And I was so happy that uh, (laughs) it finally got a reaction out of her because it's a show that's all about jaw dropping moments. And when uh, when Jen walks up and addresses him as his father, I I glanced over and Katie's jaw was agape. And I was like, yes, yes, we got you. Finally, it took 17 episodes, but we got you. Can I say it's also interesting that we're far enough in the first season that the show is really getting to not just play with parallels in the episodes themselves, but to earlier scenes from within what they've already built. Like you talked about kind of the hourglass plot of Jen and Son, but you also have kind of a contrast where a character at a turning point come goes to a father figure. In the last episode, it's Sawyer going to Jack's dad, not knowing that. And in this one, Jen going to his own and in both cases being told, like, you can, you know, you have the ability to just change your own path you're on. You can make a decision to go forward with this. Obviously, what they're being encouraged to do is drastically different. But just the idea that, like, the same advice in a different context can be something that for Jen would have been healing and uh, a matter of reconciliation. For Sawyer is driving him into a much deeper and darker place than he was in before. And it speaks to the overall plot of the entire series, which is fate versus free will. Yeah. Do we continue on the path that we're on uh, because we're supposed to, uh, because destiny says we have to continue along this path, or can we make the choice to consciously break away from it? Yeah. I love the exchange where Jen's, you know, lamenting his situation. He says, you know, like she hates me because of the work I do for her father in a good world. She'd hate him and not me. And his dad just goes, Jen, it is a good world. I just, Man, it's like sometimes people just need to hear that. Mm -hmm. Yep. The other interesting parallel for me is um, when you have the big climax of the episode where um, Michael is uh, convinced that Jen burned down the boat and um, Son speaks English to try to translate Jen's denials that it happened, but people are still skeptical. Locke comes and diffuses the whole situation by just reminding everybody, you know, there are people in the elsewhere on the island who have attacked us and murdered us and maybe we should worry about them which is interesting because that is sort of the same structure as jack's live together die alone speech you have a conflict among the survivors that's escalating and somebody comes in and doesn't really resolve the basic issue that you know in white rabbit it was that boone had stolen the water trying to ration it and in this case it's that the raft got burned and they don't know who did it but they point to a bigger issue. It's like, look, we need to come together for this reason. And Jack is pointing to basic survival and Locke is going to, there is an external threat that we need to all be united against. And it's again, interesting to, that like Jack and Locke are now the two sort of pillars of leadership on the island because they're the ones who have the clearest eye on the big picture when it really counts. Uh, his monologue, Locke's monologue, where he says, um, we're not alone on this island and we all know it. For some reason that has lived rent free in my head for the last 20 20- years. Some, well, 20 years since it aired, 15 years since I first watched it. But just um, Terry O'Quinn's delivery is so fucking good in that scene. Despite the fact that he actually does know who burned the raft. Yeah. Uh, it, it was Walt. Poor, oh. poor Walt. He's uh, just tired of moving. Yeah. And for a child actor, the his explanation is so well delivered and so well written that you actually, in a moment... You, you forgive the kid. It's a great episode for Malcolm David Kelly, both for the little moment where um, he starts trying to throw sand on the raft to put it out when Michael is like screaming at son to tell him where Jen is because he, you, you see him play the moment of realizing just how much this has hurt his dad and trying to just do anything he can to address it in the way that, you know, kids do because they don't know how to, how else to make things right. And then his, yeah, backgammon scene with Locke where continuing the foreshadowing of Locke's, uh, uh, family history, uh, we get one of the biggest understatements in the history of the show where Locke reveals that his dad was not a cool guy. <laughs> yeah, I love that line. I love that interaction. And Locke would know a thing or two about sabotaging an effort to get off the island. Mm. We still don't know at this point that he's the one that assaulted uh, Saeed yeah. in a much earlier episode uh, where they were trying to triangulate the signal and call out. Um So two different uh, rescue attempts, both of them sabotaged. I also really love the moment where uh, Michael is like furious at the, like just venting his anger on on the raft and at its wreckage. 
realizes that Walt's watching him, takes a moment to get himself under control and turns it into a, you know, we're going to we're going to pick it up and try again. Like the story of Michael becoming learning how to be a dad again is something that's just hitting me more on rewatch than it has before. I still don't have kids, but I have seen enough people I know become parents, enough people in my own family have become parents, and I've just gotten to watch up close the transformation that a person goes through when they realize they need to step up to that responsibility. Yeah, man, it's, and it's very sad in the knowledge of where that story is ultimately going to go. Yeah. Well, here at the end of the episode, we get um, a moment that I've been waiting for because we've talked about it several times. The usage of Hurley's CD player providing diegetic music uh, to fit the mood of whatever we want to, however we want to end this episode. And we've discussed how on the nose that can be in certain times. Um, while watching it with us, Katie pointed out um, it's, it's a nice use of... Uh, the we're going to end on a music montage trope that so many shows relied on. Specifically, I remember by the last season of Sons of Anarchy, they had run that into the ground because every episode of season seven of Sons ended on a fucking music montage. <laughs> and after a while, it just sort of takes away the impact of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, they've used it sparingly. In the, excuse me. <coughs> They've used it sparingly throughout this season, and but it's been varying degrees of effective. But here, I think, is where it works the best because the batteries in it after, what did I say, 32 days? Is that correct? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, 34, 34 days. Yeah. After 34 days, the batteries in Hurley CD player finally die. The music cuts out mid-song, and all he can do is look at it and say, son of a bitch. And that... CD player cutting out is the harbinger of doom for the what's about to happen for the rest of the season. Yeah. I think it's brilliant. Uh, it's a great usage of that uh, old cliche, the, uh, you know, music montage. Great stuff. And again, nice sign of confidence that they're getting, they're, they're poking a little fun at the things they've done before and being willing to signal when they're, they're about to change things up using that language to communicate with the audience. So now we move on. We end that episode with Hurley and we start the next episode with Hurley. Um, Episode 18, Numbers, which takes place on days 35 and 36 and does not start with an iWatch. I didn't write one down. I don't think so. I think it just starts directly with the flashback of Hurley fresh off work from the chicken shack. What was that called? Um, Oh, uh, I think it might have been just the chicken shack. I was trying to remember the name of the place on uh, Breaking Bad. Uh, Pollo Loco. Yeah. Uh, I think it was something like... No, no, Pollo Hermanos. Oh, yes. Pollo Hermanos. Oh, yes, the, the Chicken yes. Brothers. That's right. Mm. Um, I think it was something like the Cluckin' Shack or something, because, I don't Yeah, I can't remember that one. That's okay. Uh, ultimately, it's, it's just a background joke, because this episode is all about, as the title implies, the numbers. How many of you guys still remembered after all these years those six numbers? I remember most of them. Um, yeah, that that one's I think gonna just stick with me for a while, and not only because I don't do it anymore, but there have been times in the past where I needed like a four or six digit number code. I would pull some combination out of here. Mm-hmm. I really did think about playing them as lottery numbers once. Oh, uh, I'm but sure then I was like, does every time? Oh, I'm sure, I'm sure. But I was like, but you know. If uh, I if I did win, then I would feel like I was cursed, and then I'd be too terrified. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that became a thing for a long time after the show. People using the numbers to play the lottery, and I'm certain that there are nerds out there like us who, 20 years later, would still do that. Uh, but yeah, four, eight, fifteen, sixteen, twenty-three, forty-two. Uh, forty-two uh, was chosen specifically as a Douglas Adams reference. Nice. Um. So just throughout, I was taking notes on number watch, uh, so it's going all over the episode here, but um, they mentioned that this is the 16th week with no winner uh, in, the, in the lottery of uh, wherever Hurley is at, uh, which is why it is, the, the amount is so high. Uh, I think he's in, he lives in Los Angeles because they mentioned that uh, when he's wrongly right. arrested, the LAPD is the that's one that right. settles with him. Yep. And that makes sense. That's why he would have been on his way back there from Australia. Um, the ultimate like progenitor uh, of the numbers, Sam Tooley, has been dead at this point for four years. 
which means that he died again. I don't know why I'm so obsessed with this, but that means he would have died sometime in the year 2000. Um, he first heard the transmission and then went on to win the bean game 16 years ago. So we get 16, four and 16. And those are just the ones that I caught. I'm sure there's more. Um, how many members of Rousseau's team were there? Was it, was it five, including her? I thought it was four, including her. So that could be another one. Yeah. Uh, it might've been five, but I feel like now that I've said that out loud and it's one of the, one of the numbers, uh, that's probably it. Um, again, we're going to take it back for a second uh, to the Dark Tower because anybody who's read the Dark Tower knows uh, how much that relies on specific number usage. Uh, in that series, it's 9 and 19. Um, so it's it feels fitting uh, for the show to have specific numbers. And of course, does anybody here remember the, uh, I want to say it's 2007 Jim Carrey classic, the number 23? I do remember that. Oh, and there was a uh, semi horror movie or you, I guess you could call it a thriller. I don't know uh, about a man who becomes obsessed with the number 23 and how you can find it in just about anywhere if you look hard enough, which is less a matter of like this being a thing and more about the fact that the human brain is wired to see patterns and yeah. you can get almost any number out of any other number if you you know combine it the right way. Yeah. Or if you want to get desperate and you divide it the right way yeah. or, um, and of course, there was a Ryan Reynolds movie that came out around this time as well called The Nines, which is the same sort of thing. And it's an obsession about the number nine. That hmm. one I did not remember. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, very early, very young Ryan Reynolds. Um, that's something that we're going to talk about more and more as these numbers continue to come up. But uh, I think it's worth mentioning on my next note here is inconsistent island trek time. It took Sawyer, when, or not Sawyer, Saeed, days when he set off on his journey of self-reflection to find the cable on the beach that led him into the woods to get to uh, Rousseau because yeah. I, like a solid week passed. Yeah, Kate says he's been gone for a week. But, you know, he could have spent like most of that time just sitting on a rock staring at the ocean like Kate does. Uh, that's a very good point. So, like the first three days were nothing but self-reflection as he <laughs> stared out at the ocean, mm-hmm. the horizon. Mm-hmm. That's fair. Um, however long it took him, Hurley was able to do it in a few hours. We're he- not exactly told how long it took. Uh, time wise but it's the same day that he sets out on his trek he makes his way to the uh, to the cable that's running out of the ocean well it's the secret of Hurley when he sets his mind to things he can display a lot of surprising competence at mm-hmm. things that aren't fishing <laughs> uh, you know after just saying you know reaching for connections that aren't necessarily there I'm sure you could chalk this up uh, as like oh you know the island's always changing and shifting and mm. uh, you know that cable might have been three days away a few weeks earlier, but now it's only a few hours away. Isn't that weird? No. Oh. The oh. easy answer is mm. it's magic. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, in this episode, we also find out that uh, one of the subsid not subsidiaries, one of the investments that Hurley made with the money that he won was to buy a box company. Which character do we know that used to work at a box company? John Locke. Uh-huh. Uh, they even down to having the ex- same exchange, a box company. They make boxes. <laughs> Every, oh, and everyone needs boxes. Apparently, uh, the uh, that whole scene with the accountant, the punctuation on it is when the guy insists that he, the accountant says he doesn't believe any curses, he just believes in numbers. Right as a person goes flying past them in the in the window outside. Apparently, the writers, because um, they had at some point decided that Locke would have become paralyzed by falling from a building and they wondered if there was a way to make him actually that person decided against it both because they were like you know what no that's too darkly comic of a moment for to to try and also the timelines didn't work out just how that's relatively soon before Hurley goes to Australia versus Locke having been in a wheelchair for a couple of years but yeah because I want to say that it was also around 2000 that Locke was paralyzed and this episode takes place throughout 2004 i think it's implied that um hurley's only been a millionaire for like less than a year yeah so it would have been a late late 2003 early 2004 when he won the lottery um so we're gonna do a uh, another check-in with uh, one of the ones that robert came up with the jungle run watch and we have a late but strong contender it's true dominic monahan coming in with the classic 
assholes and elbows Tom Cruise run uh, when he goes tearing off in the jungle after a great exchange. One of, <laughs> one of the best in this episode between Hurley and um, and Charlie uh, is when Rousseau starts shooting at them, fires off a couple of rounds. They look at each other and is it, I think it's Hurley that yeah. says, is somebody shooting at us? And then they fight like another one more gunshot and they realize they need to run, but, yeah. which... We should see that so much more often in film and TV because you always have characters, they hear a gunshot, they immediately recognize what it is and die for cover. But it's like, no, most of us would have a moment where we would just be like, what was that? Hey, did someone just hit that tree? Was that a bird or something? Well, it's also fair to say, I think, because the three of us will live in the South, that whenever we hear gunshots, there has to be a moment where we at least consider the possibility they could have been fireworks. Yeah. Oh, that's like a almost a daily occurrence here because somebody over in that direction or that direction, I, I'll stop and go, is that a gunshot? And then sometimes I'll hear, you know, like, bang, 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 bang. And I'm like, that was probably a gun. But we're not going to pursue that. The no. The line of thought. No. Um, so let's see. We've got... Um, we've got Dominic Monaghan, we've got Evangeline Lilly, Josh Holloway, uh, Matthew Fox. Those are like our four main jungle runners. Um, we've gotten a little bit uh, out of, out of uh, Boone, uh, Ian Summerholder. Not an impressive showing. No, no. absolutely not. Uh, neither was Maggie Grace. I don't think at this point we have seen John Locke run yet. I think we get a brief glimpse when he and uh, Michael are going to try to save Walt from the polar bear. It's a bit solid. I mean, older guy, you know, moving a little a little more gingerly, but with purpose. Mm -hmm. But I would say those are our four contenders right there. Uh, Charlie, Jack, Sawyer, and Kate. Um, I just love that, and I love that you pointed that out, Robert, because now that's all that we see. Whenever somebody takes off running, it's like, oh, oh, what uh, what's their jungle run like? All right, uh, so over the course of the episode... Uh, Hurley goes down a rabbit hole trying to find the origins of the numbers. We and learned that, that he was in a uh, mental institution for some time. Yes. So he goes and he visits the person that uh, he heard the numbers from originally and uh, gave him the idea to play them for the lottery. And that leads him to Australia, to the home of Sam Tooley, uh, who heard them on a transmission uh, well, he was in the Coast Guard, I think they mentioned. Yeah, like a naval watch station or something. I think, uh, I think, yeah, Hurley's friend was in the Navy, and I think Sam was in, like, the Australian Coast Guard or whatever it was. Wherever he was, he was close enough to the island that he heard the transmission with the numbers, uh, which would have been around 1988. I'm sure that we could probably make a stretch and find the numbers in that somewhere. But uh, anyway... We find out from the late Sam Tooley's wife that he won I, a, a fair a contest yeah. at the fair. Yeah, a, a guy has a jar. It's full of beans, and you get fifty thousand dollars if you guess the correct number of beans. And uh, we are told by his wife that the jar. <laughs> the only indication of how big this jar was is that it was about the size of a pony, and it contained. I'm sorry. How many beans, Robert? It contained 4,815,162,342 beans. Exactly. And just because I uh, decided to do a little math on this, the smallest variant of the common beans is the azuki bean, which is about half a centimeter long, five millimeters. Assuming, so like uh, five by five cubic millimeters and no space for oxygen or anything between the beans, um, this would be about 2,408 cubic meters of space needed to contain that number of these. Again, these are the smallest beans we have. So not like lima beans or garbanzo or anything like that. A regulation Olympic sized swimming pool is 2,500 cubic meters. So this is just under enough beans to fill an Olympic sized pool. Uh, just for comparison, uh, she says the jar was as big as a pony. The largest blue whale ever recorded, largest animal, uh, had an, would have had a volume of about 204 cubic meters. So if the jar was the size of the largest blue whale ever recorded, it would have been um, about uh, a twelfth of the size necessary to contain all of those beans. Which... Also, Martha says it's, it was a scam the guy was running, and he was shocked someone got it right, which makes you wonder why he wouldn't just be like, nope, sorry, wrong guess, no joy for you. 
It, it also makes me wonder, like, what happens if you lose count? What happens if you make it to around three billion and then you sneeze or you knock your cup of coffee over and you're like, all right. Shit. Was it three billion, 142 million or was it three billion, 143 million? That guy should have been in the bar with Christian and Sawyer because he's still counting those beans and just drinking at the thought of what his life has become. Well, I went to Reddit uh, in search of an answer that I sent you guys, and somebody on Reddit uh, made the much more reasonable point. It's possible he just chose a combination of those numbers. Like he, he looked at it and he said, uh, 4,815, you know, 4,815, or some variation 48, of that. 48,000, whatever, well, whatever. Sure, if you want to enjoy things and not be <clears throat> nitpicky. I like your explanation a lot better, though. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, finally, my, I think probably my biggest takeaway from the episode as a whole is uh, at the very end when he, Hurley is talking to Charlie, he tells him that he won $156 million in the lottery. And this tells you about how jaded I am by working uh, for corporate America 9 to 5. I was like, $156 million really doesn't sound like that much money anymore. Like by 2004 standards, $156 million was... Uh, an ungodly amount of money. Now I'm like, oh, well, it's certain I wouldn't turn it down. That's for damn sure. Yeah. But uh, it does not sound like well, maybe early that retirement was, money. Maybe that was his uh, takeaway after you know the you take the the lump sum payment and you know that you typically cuts it what like in half. So yeah. maybe it was like a three hundred and something million. Well, I think the account at one point says like you've almost doubled your net worth from your initial winnings just based on like investments that are. Oh, yeah, that's like, true. Because he invested in orange groves and that went up after a hurricane devastated Florida. So all of yeah. his success is tied to someone else's misfortune. He bought a box factory and sales have been booming. Um, he sued the LAPD for wrongful imprisonment after they confused him with a drug dealer. Um, this is the most darkly comic episode of this entire show, I think. I don't know if there's an episode that, that surpasses this one in the sheer amount of dark comedy. I think Nikki and Paolo's episode might be up there. Um, but yeah, I think one of the writers on this one was David Fury, who was a longtime staff writer on both uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Angel. So I think he does have that sort of Whedon-esque, very, very black sense of humor. I love it. Um, so that wraps up our actual like episode discussion, unless you guys have any final thoughts about this three episode run that we did. I do like what we get about Hurley's character, that, which is that his when he gets all of this money, his instinct is just to take care of other people that he wants to, you know, make it so his grandfather can retire. He wants to buy a house for his mom. Just, you know, a reminder that Hurley is the kind of person who, given power and resources, his just thought is to make things better for people around him, which we've already seen with his, you know, building of the golf course and other things on the island and is going to play into where he ends up by the time the series is done. Well, and he also, you know, has to keep a little bit of that for himself. You, you got to do something selfish once in a while. He does the most 2004 thing ever and buys himself a sweet ass <laughs> yellow Hummer H2. Uh, Cause he can, he can afford to put gas in it at uh, eight miles per gallon as the H2 famously got. Every time I see a cyber truck, I feel nostalgic for when the H2s were the, were the douchebag status symbol. Uh-huh. Um, I, yeah, I did, will say the, uh, the interaction that he has with Rousseau where he hugs her because she's the first person to not be like, no, you're crazy. Um, just the look of relief on Jorge Garcia's face, the interaction between them. It's so genuine and sweet that I, I want more uh, Hurley and Rousseau. Also seems like kind of a little nod from the, uh, from the creators to the fans, which is that he's not really looking for an explanation. Like he doesn't need her to break down. Well, the numbers mean this and that's why this is happening. He just needs someone to sort of share an emotional moment with him to just feel that he's not alone somewhere that the answers are about less than finding a, an endpoint on a, on an emotional journey, which, you know, is something that the, uh, I think uh, Damon Lindelof at one point got asked, like, if there was, like, a cosmic significance to the numbers. And he was like, look, we we never wanted to have, like, a Qui-Gon Jinn explains midichlorians moment where we just were like, you know, this is what specifically the numbers mean in the cosmology of our universe. He was like, it's a crazy thing, and it just expresses itself this way. And it's about how the characters react with it and how it impacts their lives. And that's great, because we never do get an explanation out of the show. Um 
it comes up a lot and it's something that fans quote unquote or watchers of the show have, have been sore over for the last 20 years we never get a solid explanation about why 4 8 15 16 23 and 42 are so significant uh, other than the fact that uh, they add up to 108 which is something that'll become important in season two uh, so, Kara, you sent a great question to our group chat uh, for the three of us to round this out with. Which survivor, <clears throat> excuse me, which survivor would we most like to be trapped on the island with and why? So why don't you take that one to start with? So I, I really, I, I have two reasons for why I would want to be Trapped on an island with John Locke. And honestly, he was my top choice. My second choice was Vincent. Um, Because, you know, listen, if I got to be on an island, I want to be with a dog. Maybe I can have both of them because, you know, the human, not human thing. But aside from his weird preparation for this exact kind of lifestyle, you know, hunting and tracking and knowing how to make weird psychedelic paste out of a fruit. Um, he's got skills. He's, I, I, he's good looking. Like I absolutely, there's something about like that little sparkle in his eye when he gets that, it's like mischievous and oh my goodness. Um, but I, I also really like the, um, I, sup, not supernatural, mystical aspect of John Locke. And, you know, e- even though I'm in real life much more of a, a logical person, you know, kind of like Jack, I, I just really gravitate towards what Locke brings on, on different levels. Very nice. Robert, how about you? Uh, is it like a general desert island or like this island specifically? I think this island specifically. Yeah. Okay, because if it was general island, hands down it would be Saeed because, you know, someone who's got the capability to repair electronics, who thinks to build a signal fire, is physically capable against, you know, uh, outside threats. I was like, you know what, I would want to buddy up with this guy for survival. Uh, this island in particular, um, probably Boone, just so that when I did inevitably die, I would have the good feeling that at least I wasn't the first one to go. That's fair. That's a very good point. Um, my answer was also going to be Vincent because I was thinking about this and I was like, who is the person I'm going to be least annoyed by? Because (laughs) don't get me wrong. I love all of these characters. We've talked a lot about how much they've stuck with me over the last 20 years. But Jack is going to get really obnoxious after a while. Sawyer would probably be fun at first. and then it, Oh, no, he wouldn't. What? He'd be an insufferable ass. He'd be insufferable, then he'd get fun, and then he'd get insufferable again. Yes, exactly. It would just be that over and over again. Did nuclear war happen? I hope not. No, we'd have heard the sirens. We're close enough to the... <laughs> That's a good nuclear place. Uh, Listeners, if you hear a weird uh, like noise in the background, there's apparently a uh, some kind of noisy cricket, noisy cricket inside our recording area with it. So it sounds like a fucking alarm is going off for a brief second. We wondered if we were under some kind of nuclear attack. Anyway, sorry about that, (laughs) listeners. Um, Yeah, Sawyer would get obnoxious after a while. Kate would get obnoxious after a while. If I needed her help building up a fire and she was just standing there staring out of the horizon, Shannon obviously isn't going to lift a finger to help. Boone is going to be annoying. I was like, fuck me, man. After a while, I'm going to get sick of all of these people. Uh, But I don't think I'd ever get sick of Vincent. No. Uh, So I'm, I'm going with him. That's a good choice. Yeah, like Solid. Locke would be good until he decides you need some moral character development. He knocks you out, ties you up, and smears you with an hallucinogen. Which, again, no judgment if that's what you're feeling. I mean, hey, I'd be down for that. <laughs> there's a lot. <laughs> there's a lot to unpack there, Kara. <laughs> um, well, obviously, so the follow up to that is, who do you not want to be trapped with? I feel like I already sort of did this one. Um, it's any of them for me personally. <laughs> I would not want to be trapped on an island with a bunch of people with fucking daddy issues. 
Um, because all of them, all of them have daddy issues. Um, Kira, uh, who would you not, uh, we, we all, if we, anybody who's been the three of us and anybody who's listened to the show up to this point, know who you would do not want to be trapped on this Island with. I tried really hard to not choose Shannon, but I just fucking hate her so much. I know. I know it's terrible. Um, at, well, you know, maybe, maybe baby Aaron, like once he gets born, just cause oh. he's a baby and I wouldn't want to deal with that. No, no. That was part of my uh, line of thinking. I was like, well, I wouldn't just be trapped there with Walt. Like he and Michael are a package deal. So even though Michael might be cool, you're also going to have to deal with like a 10 year old. Yeah. And, no, uh, may or may not have psychic powers. Right. Yeah. I don't and need I, that in my no, life. No, I don't need that kid. Like attracting birds or reading my mind or whatever fuck that no uh robert who who would you least like to be trapped in this island with uh probably not the marshal because i feel like you know he's got a chunk of shrapnel in his abdomen and i'd feel like i would need to do something but have no qualifications for it so it would be just like a long long chain of me thinking of what seems like the logical thing to do in that situation and then making it worse he dies eventually and i just you know i'm I'm really bummed out for the rest of my again probably very short time on the island oh man <coughs> and i would not be able to get a halliburton case open so <laughs> no no even his guns wouldn't be any use to me a halliburton case robert <laughs> you're not getting one of those open without a key <laughs> halliburton give us money <laughs> Um, all or right. Dixie Pig, give us barbecue. Uh, either or. Uh, we really should like try to figure out some kind of sponsorship if we're going to continue like doing this for uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, so we are now on the uh, the short run to the end of the season. Let me. Uh, we have four in this next chunk. Yeah, we're going to do a batch of four. Uh, Deus Ex Machina, Do No, do no harm, harm, The Greater Good, and Born to Run. The Greater the Good. Greater good. Damn it. Um, and then that puts us, yeah, that puts us right up to Exodus. Uh, so we're very close now, guys. And um, there's already been some discussion, but I think we uh, we should talk at some point about like doing an in-between season episode. Um, I have ideas that I'll share with you that mm. we'll figure out. In the meantime, uh, Robert, if people want to reach out to you online or follow you online, where can they do that at? I am still hanging on to the uh, skeleton of a social media site that was Twitter once upon a time, RedbeardRob17. Kara, what about you? You're still boycotting social media? Yeah, you know, I mean, I get on uh, Instagram mostly to look at other people's stuff, but uh, for the random shit I do post, it's at HistoryNerd1861. Love it. And if you want to follow me online, the best place to do that is on Instagram at DB Hensley. If you want to keep up with Long Walk Productions, you can visit us online at longwalk.us. To see more of our original work or hear past episodes that are no longer streaming, you can follow the YouTube links in the show notes. Thank you very much for listening. And if you enjoy this show or any of the shows on the Long Walk Podcast Network, please make sure to leave us a rating and a review on whatever platform you are listening on.